we are truly now at a fiscal and monetary dead end. Uh, and I really mean dead end. Welcome to Thoughtful Money. I'm its founder and your host, Adam Taggart. To better understand the current economic environment we find ourselves in, it helps to better understand how we ended up here. And few have as detailed an understanding as today's guest, who's been a true insider in both Washington, D.C. and Wall Street for his extremely long and accomplished career. We're fortunate today to speak with former congressman, economic policymaker, and financier David Stockman. David, thanks so much for joining us today. Great to be with you. Well, David, look, it's uh, it's been a while since we've been able to sit down together. Uh, I've known you for a long time. Um, it's so great to finally see you again here and have you with your inaugural appearance here on Thoughtful Money. Um, I, I gave the streamlined introduction um, because you you really have done so much. And I just want to I just want to read sort of your official CV here for folks, just so they know your backstory. Uh, David Stockman represented Southern Michigan in the U.S. House of Representatives from 1976 to 1981 and later served as the director of the Office of Management and Budget in the Reagan administration and was the youngest cabinet member of the 20th century. Since then, he's held executive positions in many of the most influential banking, buyout, and private equity firms, including the Blackstone Group and Solomon Brothers. Uh, I don't know if this is still true, but at least I know that you've served as a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and you have many other accomplishments, too numerous to list here, including a brand new book out. Anything else you want to add to that? Uh, I, I, think pretty, list? I think we pretty well covered it, but it does remind me uh, of an issue that we've talked about over and over, and I think it's a, pers a good place to start. We are truly now at a fiscal and monetary dead end, uh, and I really mean dead end. And one way, you know, you always need context because everybody's been reading, you know, the debt was, uh, public debt was up a trillion dollars in the last hundred days and it's continuing to rise rapidly. And uh, I think by the end of this fiscal year, it'll be 37 trillion, not 34. Sometime in 2025, it'll be, uh, you know, 30 trillion, I mean, 40 trillion. And then we're heading uh, to uh, 60 trillion before the end of the 30. So the point is, it's a huge growing number, but sometimes we lose track of it because of the recency bias. We just keep hearing another trillion here, another trillion there. I happened to be able to note the other day at a conference I was at, I went to Washington in 1970. Uh, started as a young staffer on Capitol Hill, the public debt was $325 billion at the time. It's $34.5 trillion today. That, now, that's a nice round 100x. And of course, you can say, well, yeah, big numbers, but uh, you know, the economy is a lot bigger. There's been a lot of inflation. But the fact is, even if you take the nominal GDP, which after all is the national income that we have to support uh, and finance that uh, 100x gain, the nominal GDP is only up from 1.2 trillion to 27 or so where we are today. So the point is, it's a half century in which the public debt has mushroom, uh, mushroomed 100x compared to an economy that's up by 25x in the same nominal dollars. Now, you, you don't have to do a lot of fancy math to understand that that doesn't compute, that doesn't sustain, and that now that we're at an accelerating rate of growth in the debt and the Fed is reached a dead end, in my view, where uh, it's not going to be able to monetize uh, any more of the debt for a good while to come. We've got a real dilemma. <laughs> you know, the chickens are finally going to come home to roost. And I think that big picture framework is what uh, provides uh, the context for understanding where we might be heading in the near term in terms of financial markets, uh, politics, elections, uh, the world economy, and a lot of other things. All right. So I usually ask as my kickoff question, what's your current assessment of the global economy? Well, you just sort of <laughs> nailed it there with this, this monetary and fiscal dead end. So l let me ask you a couple of questions, um, both sure. short and long term. Um, I, I guess short term, um, you, you, I think I just heard you say that the, the Fed is going to be compromised in its ability to monetize the debt going forward. So can you explain the why of that statement? 
Sure. And and also, let's have some context. I think the 100x number on the public debt is a pretty you know easy thing to contemplate, 1970 to present and half century. The Fed's balance sheet was 70 billion back then in 1970, and it peaked recently at 9 trillion. It's a little so that's 130x, and it tells you something. If the economy grows 25x, uh, the debt grows 100x, and the balance sheet, which is really just the tracking of how much money has been printed cumulatively over time, is up 130x, you can see what the game has been. We should have had a crisis a long time ago. Uh, the bond vigilantes should have been, you know, uh, creating uh, havoc. Uh, we should have had uh, rapidly rising interest rates crowding out in the bond pits and all the things we've always talked about. But the Fed saved the day. It came in and essentially uh, uh, absorbed the debt, monetized the debt at such a fantastic sustained rate, which obviously, again, has accelerated enormously since 2019, that the day of reckoning was postponed. But then suddenly, out of the blue, when uh, we had... Uh, you know, we had Paul and all the rest of us, uh, rest of them telling us that it was transitory, don't worry. We get 40 year high inflation. And after the peak, which was way back in June 2022, as we all remember, uh, we're still at a point where it is not settled down. I look at the, uh, you know, 16% trim mean CPI. I think it's a much better, more stable, uh, uh, more smooth measure of where we're going. It came in to, today again at 3.5%. It's been stuck there since last March, which means that they've uh, uh, unleashed an inflationary tide in the economy that simply isn't going away even if you believe the 2% target, which I don't you know, think makes a lot of sense, but it's there. And as a result, they're not going to be, uh, you know, <laughs> restarting the printing press, so to speak, uh, that is cutting rates. That's just the, you know, that's just the outward uh, evidence of what they're doing. They're not going to be starting that anytime, in my view, in 2024. And I don't see how they started the next year or the year after. Uh, the inflationary pressure is just too uh, deeply and thoroughly embedded in the economy. There's a lot of dimensions to that that we can get into. But think about this. With the Fed, with the Treasury, Uncle Sam, now borrowing a, a trillion dollars every hundred days, and that's accelerating, by the way, with an election coming up between two guys uh, who should have been retired long ago, neither of which has any interest in reducing the deficit. I mean, Trump doesn't care. And Biden, uh, you know, throws some numbers on the screen like he did today, uh, which aren't credible and uh, are not going to change anything. So if you have an election that won't address the matter, if you have a political system that is entirely dysfunctional on the matter, we're going to have growing borrowing and, uh, you know, the Fed isn't going to monetize it. And, and so therefore, interest rates are going to remain uh, much higher than they've been over this artificial period of the last decade or two decades. And I think the market is uh, mispriced for interest rates, uh, let's say on the 10 year, that remain way above 4%, 5%, 6%. Uh, when you have, uh, you know, the 10-year, which is the benchmark, it's the cap rate, really, for the whole economy uh, trading where I, I think it's going to be five and, and up from there, uh, you, you can have a PE at 25 or 30 times uh, because it just doesn't compute. And, but that's that's where the market is today. So I think we're in an, you know, an inflationary blow off, uh, you know, a speculative uh, top in the market. Again, we have the top 10 stocks, as I think a lot of people know, accounting for 33% of the total market cap of the S&P 500, which is even bigger than the 25% share that the top 10 had uh, back in 2000 at the peak of the dot-com bubble. So we've got a great, tremendous bubble. We've got you know an enormous amount of speculative uh, flows into a shrinking number of um, you know mega cap cap stocks, 
all premised on interest rates far lower over the long haul than they are today and that they can possibly be uh, over the next several years. So, you know, there, <laughs> there's a, a moment uh, coming that probably won't be as pleasant as people, you know, would like to like to experience, obviously. Well, it sounds more than more more than that, right? So you're you're talking about a market repricing, and it sounds like the market would need to reprice anyways, um, given the fact that interest rates are higher than most folks think. But we're also in the speculative fervor, meaning the fall is going to be potentially hard, a lot harder because of that. I want to talk about where, like, how violent you think the market correction could be. But before we get there, let's talk about the economy. Um, because if interest rates are going to go higher, like we already have a, a, a higher for longer economy, right? Uh, the, the Fed raised rates and has kept them there longer than most people expected, and certainly longer mm -hmm. than the market initially expected, right? Market was always printing in a pivot and rate cuts and has always had to adjust, right? Um, a lot of people initially said, there's no way the economy is going to be able to handle, you know, interest rates sure. at five or higher, right? And it, yep. and it kind of magically has, and, and, and I've, I've had a lot of discussions on this channel about why, and it seems to be, you know, lots of, of net liquidity that's been pumped into the system. You can, you can really kind of, you, 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 you can very clearly see that in, in October, 2022, those who track liquidity show that the flows turned positive again right then. And that's when everything's sort of gone off to the races. The question is, is how long can that continue for? You talked about the deficit spending that's been going on in addition to things like the BTFP and the the draining of the re reverse repo program and and some of the things that were going on with the TGA that that again all help kind of push liquidity into right. the system. So it it it's it, it's extended now. If rates interest rates go even higher here over you know a secular term, right? Um, that's got the lag effects have got to eventually start pulling this economy you know materially lower and so. We've got this, we've had this battle between hard landing and soft landing. Narrative wise, the soft landing or even no landing folks have won out here, right? Are you expecting something much harder going forward given what inevitably must happen, I think, in this type of over leveraged economy with interest rates where you think they're going to be? No, I, I think the Main Street economy uh, is going to run out of gas because people are not fully accounting for the aberration, the totally aberrant Main Street, I'm not talking about Wall Street or you know financial liquidity or flows, but I'm talking about Main Street that happened during the pandemic and the lockdowns and the huge STEMI, <laughs> stimulus measures that were pumped into the economy during that period, because it was kind of a double whammy. On the one hand, uh, supposedly at, at one point, you know, we had, uh, uh, 60 million people uh, drawing social, I mean, drawing unemployment benefits, not all at the same time, but over a, a year or so, we had the unemployment rate soar uh, into the teens, at least on a temporary basis. The GDP in the second uh, quarter of 2020 dropped at a 32% annual rate. So on the one hand, you had an economy that, uh, you know, hit the skids, but Washington pumped in so much money so fast, the three stimulus bills, the CARES Act in March of 2020, then another one in December that Trump signed, and then another one that uh, Biden signed, American Rescue Act, a couple of months later. Altogether, that pumped six and a half trillion dollars into the economy in a very short period of time. Uh, and that that's more money, by the way. These are all big numbers, but it was more than the four point five trillion total federal spending before this whole pandemic thing started. So on the one you on the one hand, you had this enormous flow. On the other hand, they shut down large uh, parts of the economy and, you know, the restaurants and the bars and the gyms and movie theaters and the malls and so the forth. non-essential businesses. Yeah. Yeah. Which turned out to be quite substantial. But the point is. People were forced to save, to hoard cash because they couldn't spend it. Now, they did the best they could buying stuff on Amazon. And, of course, uh, merchandise goods, uh, you know, uh, exploded or sales exploded during that period. But the effect of it was to build up a totally aberrational cash balance in the household sector. 
Uh, and if you take all the uh, uh, sources of cash uh, in terms of bank accounts and money market funds and so forth, uh, they normally would would have been running 10 or 11 uh, trillion. It got as high as 18 trillion in a very short period of time. So in my view, there has been four, five, six trillion worth of excess cash, unusual cash. You could call it savings. You can call it whatever you want that built up during 20, uh, 2020 to 2022, that now is slowly being uh, worked down, but it's providing a delayed stimulus, even though they're not mm -hmm. uh, right now in current spending, uh, putting out any new money. The point is the stimulus, uh, both direct and indirect, that I'm talking about the four savings and the uh, massive uh, uh, federal uh, handouts and spending created a situation that we've never been in before and households therefore have not been nearly as sensitive uh, to uh, you know their financial risks as they might have otherwise been because there's still so much cash in the balance but the truth is the uh, cash in the bank is now working its way down quite uh, rapidly and steadily. And once uh, that uh, unusual aberrant cash cushion uh, is used up or is substantially worked down, I think the psychology of the consumer, the household sector is going to change a lot, number one, and the mechanics of uh, GDP are going to change as well because spending will then have to come out of current income and not out of, uh, you know, this uh, unusual hoard of uh, cash in the bank. Now, no one intended this. I don't think anybody had a plan in Washington to do it, but that's, that's exactly uh, what the result was during that period. And, and that you have to take into account. I call it uh, th this great iceberg of excess cash is slowly melting. And uh, as we get, uh, as the cube uh, uh, shrinks, uh, we're going to get uh, into a different macroeconomic setting. All right. So so here we've used the analogy of the pig and the python. Um, so whether, you, whether we're talking about the ice cube or the iceberg or whether we're talking about uh, the pig, how much of it's left do you think? Ballpark. Uh, roughly, and there's different ways to measure it, but I, I believe that our, over a third of it is already melted. Uh, I believe the last third won't make a difference because by then people will re realize they're not as flush as they thought they were. And so we're probably in a turning zone of the next year or two where uh, the relevant uh, active uh, part of that huge cash hoard uh, is going to be used up. And then we're going to be back on our own two feet. That is, you spend what you earn, and the economy isn't growing very fast. Earnings aren't growing up, uh, you know, uh, rel after inflation, uh, hardly at all. So we don't have a very robust economy, and we have growing interest rate, uh, rising interest rates. And by the way, and I think. Uh, uh, and you know this, but uh, I don't think a lot of investors focus on it. There's 97 trillion of debt out there on the economy. We know the public part of it is, you know, the 34. But if you take the household sector is over 20 trillion, and you take the business uh, sector, both corporate and um, uh, unincorporated, is another 20 trillion, and the balance uh, is financial. But uh, you know, I, I think what people should focus on is in round numbers, because we're uh, dealing here in a world of big things, in round numbers, we have 100 trillion of debt carry on the US economy, public and private. 100 basis points, 1% percentage point change in the rate is a trillion dollar extra cost of carry. And I think a trillion dollars is a meaningful number. <laughs> I mean, it, I think it is going to affect behavior, uh, business behavior, household behavior, uh, government behavior. There's going to, even if uh, we get into a uh, recession here that's uh, stubborn and uh, lasts longer than people would like, 
I don't think you're going to see a lot of fiscal stimulus because they really blew it uh, uh, during the, the pandemic uh, with all these uh, uh, COVID uh, 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 bailouts and, uh, you know, uh, uh, measures. So uh, you're not going to get the fiscal uh, stimulus. And I seriously doubt the Fed is going to be able to do much because inflation is just stubborn. Now, the way I look at this, and I think... But I look at both the 16% uh, trim mean CPI on a year-over-year -year basis, which is now 3.5, and I look at it on an annualized run rate basis. And the interesting point is that it uh, dropped the run rate, which is the monthly annualized rate, dropped to about 3 to 4% zone way back in March of 2023, and it's been stuck there ever since. And so when you have the current run rate stuck in the 3 to 4% range, the year over year rate, it's just math. It takes, uh, you know, an anniversary effect uh, to get into the 3 to 4% zone. And that, that's where it's stuck. Now, people say, well, you know, inflation was 9% and now it's running 3% on the headline or 3.2. So isn't that great? The battle's been won. No, actually, if you look at the trim mean year over uh, year, it peaked at 7. It's barely under 4% now. That's all the progress we've made. And it's way, way above even their own target. Now, I think the 2% target is kind of stupid. It ought to be zero. But the people on the Fed are so wedded to this idea that it's some magic elixir at 2%, just enough, not too much, not too little. Uh, and they have staked the entire credibility of the Fed on this 2.00% uh, inflation target, even if you measure it on the PCE deflator. And they're just not getting there. You can look at the, you know, all of the internals uh, of the inflation uh, uh, metrics uh, of the CPI, the PCE deflator, and all the rest of them, and you can't get there, okay? You can always find something that was too high this month, so it'll come down, like airline uh, uh, fares uh, were apparently very high, and so they'll reverse. But there's a lot of stuff going on there that's crazy. You know, they had a huge reduction built into the CPI for insurance, medical insurance costs. It was entirely a flaky kind of thing, uh, which was uh, I, nobody sort of, saw their nobody saw their medical insurance. It, it, it didn't down. come down thirty percent. That's what that was. What was built? I, I'm pretty CPI. sure it didn't come down even zero at uh, one percent. It, did, it did. Okay, we all know that. But the point is, uh, when you start cherry picking, this one or that one is going to be lower next month. So we're making good headway. That is not true. If you look at the underlying components, the uh, internals, the drivers, we've been stuck in a three to four percent percent zone, uh, I, I think, for the last uh, 10 months. And uh, there's little reason to believe until the economy really rolls over into a, a significant and long lasting recession that it's going to drop much below that. So the Fed is sidelined. That's the key point. And uh, obviously, we've had more, we've had enough fiscal stimulus uh, for a couple of decades or even a lifetime. So, so my questions are stacking up here, but, but that very last point, let me start with. Um, so I understand the, the box that the Fed is in if inflation indeed uh, you know, starts yeah. sticky, maybe even starts going back up, right? Uh, and it sounds like you're you're taking the under on Fed rate cuts going forward over the next couple of years. Um, I don't. So you mentioned both Trump and Biden don't seem to care about getting the deficit under control. Um, honestly, I don't think I can you know name a prominent uh, politician that would get up today and at least run uh, for election or re-election on a hey, we've had this excessive deficit spending. We now need to kind of rein it under control, folks, right? I just I, I just don't think we have that kind of backbone or or appetite for that kind of thing in, in today's, uh, you know, political class. You tell me if you think I'm wrong. But but where I'm going with this is, is why can't the fiscal continue? What is the limiter on the fiscal side of things? The uh, limiter is whether you monetize the debt or not. Uh, you know, the savings rate in this country is uh, basically uh, rock bottom. And if you look at what I think is important, the net savings rate, which is household savings, business savings minus government 
uh, uh, debt, okay, it, it ends up at zero. Uh, and if you go back 30 or 40 years when the economy performed well, the net savings rate was more like 7%, sometimes as high right. as 10%. And so, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but I, I just interviewed Lacey Hunt like two hours ago for my upcoming <laughs> conference this weekend. And by his calculations, it's negative. And, yeah. and he, his, yeah. that was basically the crux of his whole presentation, which is when you've got net, net negative savings as a nation, bad things happen. Well, that, that's been the, that's the truth. And if you look at this chart, and again, we don't have it on the screen, but we'll get it to you one way or another. Uh, it does look like seven, eight, nine, ten percent in the 70s and 80s. It's worked its way down. We were in the three to four percent zone uh, in the er in the 2000s. Uh, but uh, once we got into uh, big uh, borrowing after uh, the year 2000, but especially 2019, uh, it went negative, and that's where it is. In other words, government is borrowing more money than the household and business sector combined are saving. And if you don't have net saving, how do you fund uh, any net investment above depreciation in amortization of the existing stock of capital. That, that's the dilemma that we're in. And I think he's uh, totally right on that. And that's uh, why I think it can't go on. The Fed basically created false savings. <laughs> you know, it created uh, in the period from the financial crisis, as everybody remembers, the, the you know, the Fed's balance sheet was 900 billion. Uh, uh, it ended up at 9 trillion. All right. So you, you, you created eight trillion worth of, uh, of credit uh, out of uh, thin air. And it was that eight trillion of credit from 208 to 2021, 20, 22 that, you know, kept this whole game going and allowed a, a fiscal policy that should have actually been pretty brutal in terms of its impact on the economy and on the interest rates and the ability of Main Street households and businesses to borrow, uh, we, uh, you know, we sort of stole a decade and a half uh, of unsustainable, uh, you know, monetary finance, central bank finance. I think it's something most people don't realize, to your point, is we just stole, in your calculation, I guess, a decade and a half worth of future prosperity. Yeah, right? exactly. Exactly. And, and the mechanism is quite simple. The government, if we, see, back in the day when I was a budget director, we've, we've talked about that before. It was before we had uh, Volcker was chairman of the Fed. He, he wasn't about to monetize the deficits that were being created by the politicians, Republicans or Democrats. He knew it was unsound. It was unsustainable. And it was a bad policy for the central bank. So Here's the key point. The politicians back then understood that if we borrowed too much over a uh, extended period of time, it was going to crowd out private investment. And you would hear from the car dealers, you would hear from the farmers, you would hear from the small businessmen, uh, you know, you would hear uh, from the retailers because everybody has working capital that needs to be financed. Uh, they have working capital lines and so forth. And when uh, when those are being crowded out because the bond pits don't have enough savings available, uh, then you get an instant uh, feedback into the, you know, I would say the ma macro economy, the Main Street economy, and then the people out there who are being adversely impacted start <laughs> sending strong messages to Washington, and there is a kind of checks and balances fiscally. But once Greenspan found the printing press uh, in the basement of the Fed some way when he got there uh, and uh, became, you know, the toast of the town and ran that thing and then was followed uh, by Bernanke and Yellen and, and now Powell, uh, you know, all bets were off. The crowding out didn't happen. The bond vigilantes uh, were retired. Nobody heard from the local, uh, you know, uh, households and uh, you know, home builders and uh, car dealers and so forth. And so the thing drifted uh, for a couple of decades, but the new ball game utterly new is the Fed has run out of uh, rope, so to speak. And now they're gonna have to finance it the honest way, the def deficit that is uh, in the bond pits out of savings, which are meager. And that's what's going to uh, trigger um, 
you know, the next phase of the financial um, era that we're in. All right. So talk about that next phase, because I keep going to the so what of what you're talking about and where my brain goes is slower economic growth. Um, you know, uh, companies are going to be forced to to have to start cutting costs, especially as they're, they're, we go through this maturity wall over the next couple of years. You're right. saying they're going to be re-rating their debt at even higher rates than today, which is like, you know, double what they were the, the cost of the debt on their existing books. So I just don't see how we don't have a recession, uh, maybe even a pretty painful one. But you're talking about something that that feels very long lasting than just sort yeah. of your garden variety business cycle recession. Yeah, I, I think it's a lot bigger than that. I would call it the great refi reversal. In other words, if we go back to uh, the turn of the century or maybe even the right before the financial crisis, 207 or 208, um, and we look where real interest rates were, that is uh, the 10-year the or even you know, overnight money, less uh, the inflation rate, uh, you know, real interest rates were positive 2 or 3%. And for the last decade, they've been most of the time negative. Mm -hmm. uh, both the 10-year, uh, you know, is still uh, barely positive, been negative uh, uh, for at least 15 years. And the same is true uh, with the overnight money. So as a result of that, the, the entire economy was in a constant refi mode because both nominal and real interest rates were heading steadily lower. You could make money, you could help yourself by refinancing at lower and lower and lower yields. Now, there were little uh, uh, periods where rates reversed, obviously, but on a trend basis, look at the charts. They basically said for the last 20 years, you were working your way down a descending curve of rate costs, uh, rate yields, whether it was short-term money, one-year money, or 10-year, or even 30-year money. You know, as a while, I'm, I'm going to just throw this in because I think it's relevant. You remember, I think you and I talked about it. A while, uh, three or four, three years ago, I think it was, the government of Austria issued 100-year bonds mm -hmm. with a 3.5% coupon, okay? 100-year bonds. And I thought that was uh, ironic because Austria, uh, you know, hasn't even existed in its current form for 100 years. It got wiped out in the 30s, as, as people know. But in any event, though, anybody that bought one of those bonds at the time has lost 75% of their money just from the re-rating that has occurred since then. Now, I great, offer, great deal for Austria, though. <laughs> yeah, no, but I offer this because it's a microcosm of the big picture. And that is, if for 20 years, the thing to do, if you were a homeowner, if you were a, a, corp, a, you know, a, a Fortune 500 company and anybody in between, was to constantly refinance your debt at lower rates and thereby free up cash flow for buying back stock or investing or you know having another vacation or whatever you were doing. What I think is going to happen now is there is 40 trillion of household and business debt out there. Uh, you know, the average maturity uh, is, you know, maybe six or seven years at most, if you take the mortgages and the bonds and the uh, short term money and the credit cards and everything else. And for the next couple of decades, all of it is going to have to be ref refied as it comes due as it matures, and it's going to roll over into higher rates. It's going to happen year after year after year. This mass of 40 trillion of private sector debt, and I'm not even counting financial institutions now, is going to refi higher. And it'll change the psychology. It'll change the cash flows available to do things. Discretionary spending in the household sector, uh, you know, stock buybacks and shareholder distributions in the corporate sector, behavior is going to have to change in a big way and in the opposite direction of what we've had over the last 20 years as the Fed, uh, you know, monkeyed around with market interest rates and led us down this primrose path. Okay, so so paint for our viewers 
what that's going to feel like for them. You know, what I hear you saying is, is I don't see how there's not a massive market correction in, in this thing, right? Um, I see there being lots of layoffs as companies transition from labor hoarding to, dear God, we just got to, you know, we yeah. just got to survive, right? I, I, I don't see a quick snap back in the business cycle to this unless there's massive stimulus that rides to the rescue, which you are saying is unlikely to happen for the constraints that you've just mentioned. So to me, this sounds like a multi-year, I mean, maybe like half decade kind of, you know, period of forced austerity. Um, yeah, think, maybe that's what the system needs, but I just want to, I just wanted to help folks prepare for what you think might be coming. Yeah, I think uh, you can use the word austerity. You can use uh, a long slog in the, you know, uh, mud of a very uh, challenging economy. But remember, as interest rates uh, reset higher and higher, and as corp balance sheets are refinanced at higher and higher yields costs are going to go up. Household costs are going to go up. Uh, business, uh, you know, interest expense uh, is going to cut into S&P 500 earnings. So you're going to have an earnings impact first. And secondly, with higher interest rates, you're going to have higher cap rates, lower PEs. I mean, another, you know, uh, corollary of the 20 years of downward uh, trend in yields and rates and the refi thing we've been talking about was a PE expansion because, right. you know, the obvious talk on Wall Street was, well, if uh, the, uh, you know, uh, the 10 year benchmark yield is lower and lower then the PE can be higher and higher. And that's why everybody buys tech stocks because they have a long duration. And so therefore uh, with low interest rates, you want to extend your duration, all of that. But the, the point is, if PEs are basically going to reset downward, and if earnings are, and by earnings, I mean in the capital E, a big, big sense, both corporate and household, earnings are going to be squeezed by higher and higher carry costs on the, it's really the 97 trillion of debt because taxes are going to have to be raised to pay the federal part of it, the government part of it then I think it's a different economy. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's a, uh, a very um, uh, uh, sort of awkward uh, cycle, um, uh, 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 not a virtuous cycle, but uh, an unvirtuous uh, cycle where everything in a uh, sense is moving in the wrong direction. Uh, valuation multiples down, earnings down, uh, prospects uh, less and less uh, bullish, and therefore, you know, speculation is going to uh, uh, be uh, dramatically curtailed as well. Yeah, I, it, this sounds like you know the end of the era of speculation, um, and uh, and a return to probably real value investing for those that have capital left to invest. Um, let, let me ask you this uh, on the on the. Um, wages side of things, to me, this sounds like an environment where the pendulum really shifts back to the employer because jobs become scarce and people just become thankful to have a job. Um, so it sounds like it's it, 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 it's rough for the average individual because costs are going up, right? Cost of living is still marching higher. Sure. Uh, wage increases, you know, we, we've had some improvement in that relatively recently, um, you know, after years of it being a really bad trade-off. But it doesn't sound like they're going to have. It doesn't sound like wages necessarily going to keep up with the cost of living in this environment. Uh, if if these folks were in the markets, if they didn't get out in time, they're going to have you know losses from where they are today, uh, and uh, you know it's it's going to be a slower appreciation in the markets than what folks have gotten used to over the past you know decade plus. Um, you're nodding as I'm saying all this. Yeah. Uh, is, is that sort of the environment that folks should be preparing for today? Yeah, I think so. And remember, households uh, have been borrowing like there's no tomorrow. At the, t at the time of the uh, crisis in 2007, 2008, they said, oh, you know, we, we overdid it. Everybody borrowed too much. Mortgage uh, lending was out of control and so forth. Well, uh, debt 
peaked, the total household debt peaked around 14 billion, uh, trillion then, or 1415. <laughs> now it's 20 and it keeps going up. There was a short period of time where there was a small reduction in the household debt level, but that reversed quickly. And after say 2014, 2015, we were back off to the races again. So, um, you know, none, no lessons were learned, uh, no uh, adjust, adjustments were made. And so I think now it's going to happen uh, the hard way. The, that, that's the first point. So you can't support a standard of living by incremental borrowing because uh, it's going to be too expensive to do or even carry what you have. The second thing is there is a constant confusion, I believe between the level of prices and the rate of change. And of course, we, we're in such a Keynesian mindset that dominates both Wall Street and Washington because it's convenient that people say, oh, isn't it great? The headline rate was nine, now it's three and a half, so we're making great progress. No, the, the real point is that since Biden took over, the cumulative in CPI headline is up 19%. That's one fifth of whatever you had in the bank uh, not too long ago, January John. 2021, uh, one fifth of whatever wage you had at that time, which may have crept up a little bit, three, four percent, five percent in the interim, it's gone. <laughs> you know, it's gone up in smoke. So the point is that the real household sector has got a long way to go to catch up because of this cumulative inflation, even if the run rate currently is more behaved, like three or four percent. But uh, we should actually be, uh, you know, suffering or experiencing a period of disinflation. That is negative price change to at least restore some of the purchasing power that people uh, previously had. But of course, uh, you know, we, we have a policy framework uh, in the country that uh, basically says, well, we'll see your inflation, raise it 2% and move along and everybody will live happily ever after. I, I don't think the world really works that way, even though the people at the Eccles building seem to think uh, that's yeah. the case. All right. Um, I'm going to finish on the economy and then get to to, to your market outlook. Um, so uh, when when does this start to really manifest? I mean, I can point to all sorts of cracks in the system right now that suggest that we're heading towards this direction you're talking about, but when, when is it really going to be felt as part of consciously by, by the average person? Well, if I had to pick a date, and this may sound a little uh, sarcastic, but I would pick a date around January 2025, okay? And the reason, January 6th, if you want to get a specific date. <laughs> Uh, and the reason I say that is I think we're headed for a constitutional crisis that will uh, scare the living bejesus out of the establishment, out of Wall Street, out of uh, thinking people generally. And by that, I mean, uh, it is likely that you could end up with a hung jury in the Electoral College because I think you're going to have a really strong challenge to these two awful uh, main, uh, main party candidates uh, from Robert Kennedy. And I think it's possible that uh, he can pick up a lot of discontent Republicans uh, who, uh, you know, believe in fiscal austerity, and he's doing a good job of talking about that. And a lot of Democrats who've given up on the mainstream Washington uh, sort of neocon, let's have a few more wars, Democrats uh, who are running uh, the Biden administration today. He only needs to win a few states, say in New Hampshire, say in New Mexico, say in Nevada, just a few states. And the fact is the rest of the country is so divided between the red state and the blue state, the red voter, the blue voter, that nobody gets 270, okay? Uh, he only needs to get 15 or 20 electoral votes. I think it's very possible. The other two end up with less than 270. And for the first time in 200 years, the election goes to the US House under the 12th Amendment. And what people haven't even begun to focus on yet is that an election in the US House is a ball game that is so different than anything that we're used to, popular vote, electoral college vote, 
that uh, is going to have startling uh, consequences and impact. First of all, it's one state, one vote. That's the way they wrote it in 1809. And nobody could, you know, was looking ahead to a situation in 2025. So it's one state, one vote. Wyoming has the same vote in this uh, selection of a president as California. Uh, South Dakota is just every bit as important as Florida, Ohio, uh, New York, uh, or Michigan. And therefore, there's going to be tremendous maneuvering in the run-up to that House election. And uh, you know, it could take multiple rounds of voting uh, for someone to get 26 states. Now, you know, I, I can talk too long about this, but if you just think about it, take a, a state like South Dakota, the Republican congressman there is probably going to get reelected. Uh, he doesn't like Trump at all. So maybe he makes a deal with Robert Kennedy for uh, the South Dakota vote, if you follow where I'm going. Mm -hmm. uh, or uh, there is a case where someone... Uh, uh, could put together a coalition in Michigan, for instance, in which some, uh, you know, economically conservative Republicans join up with some Detroit area Democrats, and you get seven votes in the Michigan vote, therefore, for Kennedy and not for Biden or Trump. This is the kind of scenario that is not really far-fetched. It's probably more likely than not given uh, the way things are going and, you know, Trump may be in jail by then and lots of other crazy stuff, but it will create so much uncertainty about where we're going, about is the debt ceiling going to be raised, about, you know, what policies are, what are the implications for the Fed, that I think it, it starts a completely new chapter uh, in which finally all the cans that we've been kicking down the road, everything that we've been you know, sweeping under the rug comes to the surface because suddenly uh, everything has changed and the uncertainty factor has gone from, let's say on a scale of 10, from a two to a nine. And, and I think that's where we're heading. And if that happens, it's very hard to think that uh, the kind of, uh, you know, uh, let's not worry about anything speculative mania that you have in the market today can last. Uh, you know, I, I think the speculators will run for the hills uh, after a few big bad bumps that are likely uh, to develop uh, on the way to uh, the House vote uh, uh, for president. Okay, so that is totally fascinating. Um, Got to be honest, I, I've heard a tiny bit about that, but I hadn't really directed my my thinking uh, as deeply as you obviously have on this. And that that definitely would bump the uncertainty factor up as high as you just talked about. I assume for a second that we don't have that runoff, right? Yeah. That, that, that one of the two dominant candidates right now wins. How much does that push off the reckoning? Years? I Months, you know, I, I would say as much of what you talked about is math. It, it, yeah, it seems yeah, yeah. pretty inexorable. But possibly uh, it pushes it off a little bit or a few months. But here's the thing: if that doesn't happen, and somehow all the electoral votes still go to the blue candidate and the red candidate, I can see. You know, if you look at the states, you look how this is shaping up. I don't see anybody breaking away too far, uh, either Trump or Biden, above the 270. And as a result of that, you have so much uh, acrimony in the system today, so much distrust. You know, we've gone through uh, all these alleged, uh, you know, fake elections and in, in all of this stuff we've had. First, the Democrats said uh, that Trump didn't win 2016. Putin did. Well, that was a big lie. And then Trump said he didn't lose in 2020, but he actually did. So if we go into an election that is bitterly fought and maybe Trump wins and says he's going to pardon himself the day he's sworn in, uh, I think you, you could still have a pretty serious uh, post-election uh, environment of uh, political turmoil and crisis that wouldn't be as bad as waking up some morning and finding out, from my view, it'd be a good thing that Robert Kennedy is president, but from the point of view of the mainstream and the point of view of people thinking life is going to go on uh, as normal and we're going to kick the can for years to come, uh, if you wake up 
with either uh, Robert Kennedy as president or Trump again on a contested election that the Democrats believe uh, is not valid, uh, I think you're going to be in this pretty much in the same ball. Okay, so it's enough uncertainty to get the job done. Yeah, All right, exactly. Um, super fascinating. Um, so, anyways, David, um, as we start to wrap up here, uh, so many questions for you. I'm not going to get to this time around, but want you to come back on the program anytime okay. in the future that you want, especially as as you know you, you see more clarity or, 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 you know, make audible changes to, to what you just uh, outlined for us here. So let, let's talk about uh, the market risk here just for a moment. Um, again, at the end of the day, this is a, a channel of regular retail investors that are trying to prudently grow their wealth, but, but primarily avoid losing a, a big chunk of it or becoming collateral damage to exogenous forces. Many of, of, of them are the type of that you've laid out for us here. Yeah. Um, you know, right now, uh, Undeniably, we're in an era of rampant special uh, speculation, yeah. right? You know, we've got the NVIDIAs of the world trading, depending upon the day, anywhere between like 33 or 40 times sales, right? I mean, yeah. just, these are crazy numbers. Um, uh, and, you know, very narrow breath market and, and, and all the things that we can talk about, uh, about signs of sort of late stage uh, asset blow off here. Um, Combining that with your outlook of the future and the fact that you see sort of the, the, the beginning of the reckoning starting within a year -ish or so, um, at least economically, um, what's what's the size of the, the correction that you think is due in this marketplace? Well, you know, it's very hard to predict those things. You can only look at the charts. And if you look at these charts, and there are a lot of different ways to assemble them, obviously. But we look, uh, you know, very much like we were in March and April of 2000. Or maybe if you go back far enough uh, in the uh, July, August, September of 1929, and we know what happened afterwards. Uh, you know, in in um, uh, March and April of 2000, uh, the uh, Nasdaq dropped by about 30 percent in 30 days. That that's the kind of thing that happens when you're at one of these speculative blowoffs. And we do now have this is just a startling number: 33 percent of the S&P 500 market cap is in the 10 top stock stocks starting at Microsoft with 3 trillion and Apple a little under it uh, and then the other suspects. So everybody has flowed into what's working. I mean, listen to what the guys that come on uh, Bubble Vision every day. Well, you know, we're investing in A, B, and C. Why? Because it's working. Well, you know, that's just a euphemism for saying it's going up and so therefore I'm buying it. But no one ever knows uh, enough uh, to, to get out uh, or when exactly the music's going to stop. But this is so much like the setup that we've seen in speculative tops in the last century that um, you have to expect that some kind of blow off uh, adjustment will be of a kind of magnitude that uh, we saw both in 207, uh, we saw in 2000, uh, uh, we saw in uh, the 1970s uh, and certainly 1929. All right. Um, what percentage do you want on that? Well, you know, into you know the S and P five hundred uh, uh, dropped, uh, you know, fifty percent, fifty five percent. Okay, so there's a number for you, and I, I think we're in. And they'll say, well, this is different. They always say this time is different, but I think if you look at the underlying uh, uh, numbers and uh, PEs and expectations uh, for uh, in uh, smooth sailing in the economy. Uh, we're uh, heading for that kind of, you know, classic uh, every several decade uh, correction. Okay, um, thank you. All right. Well, look as we as we start to wrap up here, um, I'm going to ask you about your. Uh, well, actually, first before I get to to your books, um, given that fact, right, that that we're at risk of a halving of the current market value. Uh, are there particular assets right now that you, you assets or investing strategies that you favor? And are there any that you would just like avoid like the plague right now? 
Well, I would avoid like the plague uh, cryptocurrencies. I would avoid like the plague, the magnificent seven or whatever. I would avoid like the plague stuff that is moved by 40, 50, 100, 200 percent uh, in the last uh, few months because those all those uh, movements are signs of these blow off tops that we know about that we've seen so many times. You know, I, I was looking at it today because, uh, you know, back in 2000, uh, the top 10 uh, account for 25 percent. Well, I looked at three of the stocks. OK, three of the stocks were Cisco, GE and uh, I'm trying to remember what the th IBM. <laughs> and uh, they they accounted for 40% of all the market cap of the top 10 back then. Their uh, combined value was 1.3 trillion. Now here we are 24 years later, all of those stocks were trading at 50, 60, 100 times uh, net income. Here we are 24 years later and the market cap of those three is you know uh, down by 40%. <laughs> okay. mm -hmm. So uh, th th those are the kind of things that remind you, maybe you were smart enough to sell GE, uh, to sell Cisco and keep Microsoft, okay? But maybe you weren't. You don't know when we're at the top uh, of a, uh, you know, a blow off top. But even if you hung on to Microsoft, the rate, the return uh, since uh, then, 24 years adjusted for inflation is 3.5%. So your best deal was Microsoft at 3.5% after inflation. Your worst deal was, you know, uh, the three high, high flyers in that top 10. To me, that is a strong, powerful lesson that when you get near one of these turning points, inflection points, it's best to get out of everything that's been working. Uh, it's probably better to stay as liquid as you possibly can uh, and recognize that the Fed is not going to be crushing rates anytime soon. And that if you're making 5% or 4% on a money market or a 90-day bill, that's a pretty darn good uh, uh, return uh, considering uh, all of the alternatives. So, you know, that's my my uh, view at the moment is uh, get out of the high flyers, get into bills and wait out the storm. Okay. And then um, for the type of environment that you see going forward, um, uh, I, I guess I want to ask you about gold, but but I was going to ask generally about commodities. So commodities might, in your, in your future, might not do so hot just because economic demand is going to be I lower. think a weak economy is likely uh, to put downward pressure on what I would call use economies, uh, uh, use commodities like oil or the metals uh, or the, the uh, ag uh, commodities. But uh, obviously, uh, gold is different because it's really, <laughs> you know, it's a speculative asset class uh, and uh, it's likely to be a good uh, refuge uh, for people that are escaping the Magnificent Seven. Now, they'll do it. I mean, this is what's happened many times in the past. So it's not, I, I wouldn't look at gold as a commodity. I would look at it as a safe harbor uh, yeah. when uh, the whole uh, financial system is going through a big reset. Okay. All right. Well, in uh, in wrapping up here, um, uh I, I want to hear about your new book and let you know, uh, let you be able to tell folks where to go get it if they're interested. Real quickly, though, you wrote another book back 10 years ago, 2013, yeah. called The Great Deformation. And I use that term all the time and I cite you because um, I think it's such a great term for how the, the system and price discovery and everything has just gotten so taffy like deformed and stretched by all this, this intervention by the central planners, you know, in the wake of, of the great financial crisis. Um, and I'm just curious, because you were there as a policymaker, you know, as I said, during the Reagan era, you were the, the youngest uh, cabinet member of the 20th century, you you ran the office uh, for management and budget. Like, did you ever think the system could get this deformed as it's gotten today? Yeah, absolutely not. I mean, when you, uh, the, the thing that we had foremost on our mind uh, minds in terms of fear factor was whether the public debt was going to cross the one trillion mark. <laughs> when we got there on inauguration day, I think it was 970 billion or something like that. 
Uh, now, a trillion every hundred days. Now, I realize there's been a little inflation since then, but even setting that aside, um, it, it, it's a totally different ball game. Now, what didn't we expect? Well, every what we, we, we couldn't persuade the Republican politicians on Capitol Hill, if you can believe this, that cutting taxes was a good thing politically. They feared doing it because they felt the resulting short-term deficit would create such a crowding out effect in the bond markets that yields would go up, interest rates would go up, and the folks back home in the home building business or what other businesses would be hit hard. That's where we were then because no, and Volcker was, you know, chairman of the Fed. <laughs> and no one ever accused him of wanting to run a printing press at a red hot speed. So what we couldn't anticipate then is that we would evolve through Greenspan, uh, through Bernanke and all of his gyrations and through Yellen and now into Powell with a Fed that thinks, well, you know, uh, it looks like inflation has settled down a little bit. Maybe it's time to start cutting rates again. Why in the hell are they even thinking about cutting rates when we've had this massive, you know, infusion of credit into the system for so many years now? They shouldn't even be thinking about it if if they had any, um, you know, uh, historic appreciation uh, for sound money. So I totally want to ask, like, what you think changed in terms of mindset and you know just the the players that we have in the space but i sense that that well i can give a short right answer, answer might be a, a good long one okay no, no, give me the no, short I, one I, and I, next I, time you come on we'll dive into it yeah. well the short one is this famous uh, uh episode in one of hemingway's novels when the uh, uh the guy was asked well how did you go bankrupt and he said well, slowly at first, then of a sudden, okay? And what has happened over the last 40 years is slowly we got used to bigger and bigger deficits every year. We got used to a Fed that was monetizing a little then monetized more, then, uh, you know, bailed out the system in 99 and then bailed it out even bigger in 207, 208, and then went absolutely bonkers in 2020, 2021. So it was each step along the way was cumulative. And we got into a uh, recency bias now that is so uh, far afield from where we used to be that people simply haven't seen it coming. All right. Um, much to our detriment going forward. Um, Unfortunately. I, I, yeah. Um, well, David, it's it's been so great having you back. And okay. like I said, so many more questions I want to dig into you next time you're on. For folks that have really enjoyed this conversation, who would like to follow you and your work and learn about your new book, where can they go? Well, I, I do have a book out now. It's called Trump's War on Capitalism. And it's basically uh, an attempt to prove that he's probably the biggest spender, the biggest borrower ever to inhabit the Oval Office, and that the so-called great MAGA economy wasn't anything close to what it was cracked up to be. Uh, but unfortunately, it's going to be either Trump or Biden in, uh, 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 as the main choices, and neither of those are uh, very good. But I comment on this every day. I have a, a newsletter called David Stockman's Contra Corner. Um, you can Google it and it'll come right up. And, um, you know, the, the kind of things that we've been talking about uh, obviously are important. Uh, there are important uh, episodes or aspects that occur every day, uh, you know, like Biden put out a new budget, which is kind of a phony. So I would be reporting on that. Uh, or some move by the Fed, or some development uh, in uh, you know Washington or internationally. All of this uh, is on my daily uh, newsletter. All right. Uh, well, David, when I edit this, I will put up links on the screen here so folks know how to go to your website, get your book. Um, and uh, folks, I'll put links within the description of the video down here. And I just want to try to head off some of the potentially partisan comments that might be made, given <laughs> the focus of your book, David. Um, you have been a pretty big critic of, of Trump. This is not your first yeah. book on him. Um, but uh, you are, I think, a liberal and, and probably very equal critic 
uh, of the existing administration as well. Oh, so. yes, <laughs> strongly. I mean, there shouldn't be any confusion. Uh, I, I don't know what would be a worse Troy, uh, choice, Trump or Biden. And that's why I actually, you know, if I have to uh, say, uh, strongly support Robert Kennedy. I think he's the only guy that has uh, some reasonable idea about big sweeping changes, particularly in our foreign policy and drastically reducing defense that uh, would allow us to get back onto some kind of rational fiscal footing. All right. Well, look, um, we'll, we'll end it there. One of the questions I didn't get into um, and, and I don't even want the short answer because I, I want to <laughs> yeah. hear your long answer, which is, you know, if, if, if I made you, um, you know, Emperor David, um, because you've worked in the guts of uh, the D.C. political system and you've worked in the guts of, of the Wall Street financial system, like what reforms would you prioritize? I think somebody with your background and your mental brain power and, and your decades of sort of thinking this through and knowing personally all the parties, you know, in mm -hmm. power. Um, where you'd place your focus, but we're going to save that one for next time. David, thank you so much for coming on the program. Well, all right. Well, now is the time on the program where we bring in the lead partners from New Harbor Financial, one of the endorsed financial advisory partners by Thoughtful Money. I'm joined today by lead partner Mike Preston. John Lodra is away this week. Mike, um, I know that you have, uh, along with me, uh, followed Stockman, uh, met him in person a number of times. Um, it's been a couple of years since David and I reconnected, as I said at the beginning of the discussion. Boy, he hasn't lost a step. Um, and uh, man, he was sure bringing it today. So um, curious, what were some of the key takeaways you took from the discussion? I love David Stockman, Adam. Thank you. And I remember meeting him in New York City at a meeting with you a few years ago. In fact, I can't even remember how long ago that was. The time flies so fast. It might have been five or six years ago. But David Stockman is a legend. He's uh, He worked in the cabinet under President Ronald Reagan, as you pointed out, back in the 80s. And I think he's long been a critic, critic of, uh, of financial policies that aren't grounded in some kind of reality. And for the last bunch of years, I know David is one who speaks out on bubbles. Um, he's talked a lot about this bubble, and, and he's been early just like we've been early. And I really think it's almost impossible for one to not be early if you're paying attention in this market cycle that we've been living through here. I mean, who thought that the Federal Reserve would continue to pull out every stop to make sure this bubble never corrects, not just in the stock market, but in everything, collectibles and real estate and everything else. And as David says, they have, or they being the Federal Reserve, have a silly policy of making, uh, of saying that they, they want to have 2% inflation, 2.0% percent inflation. Why is that the policy? I don't know. I think for maybe the policy is that way because we have to have inflation. It's the only way to serve the mountain of debt that we have, the, the mountain of debt being 32 or 33 trillion right now in the United States. David Stockman says that he thinks by the end of the 2030s that we could see 60 trillion. I've read other pieces that say, well, we might see 50 trillion. It's really hard to say. We're going at a run rate of almost three trillion a year, and that's you know that's without a recession. If we see a recession, that'll go even faster. And frankly, if we have a crisis, then all all holes are barred. You know, the Fed will do whatever it takes. The ECB will do whatever it takes. They've all said that over the last fifteen years, and it's this ridiculousness that David Stockman talks about. And this is why I like him because he's not afraid to call out what he thinks is a very uh, dangerous policy, one that creates wealth disparity and um, the wrong kind of incentives and it incentivizes speculation and rewards it. I think that's all wrong. I agree with him completely. But here we are talking about it, going on 10 years, actually 15 years plus since the housing crisis and the housing bubble. It's almost like we went in simulation mode 10 or 15 years ago. And it's hard to tell what's real because money's not tied to anything real. The stock market's not tied to anything real. So what is real? I think, sadly, we're going to find out. We're going to find out when the market loses confidence in the Fed's ability to do this forever. And so just uh, a couple more things, and then, then I'll wrap up here, um, that I'd like to point out about, about David's talk. He thinks the way out of this is forced austerity. I, I can't agree more. I think that... I think that what we probably would see is a standard of living decrease of 30 to 40 percent, if I had to guess, and one that would stay that way for 10 or 15 or 20 years. 
So this is what we've been avoiding. Um, I, uh, we, we have said that the American way of life is non-negotiable. Can't remember which cabinet member said that, but that's what we have chosen to do. We've chosen to not take our medicine, not have austerity, to just keep printing money. It started way back with cash for plunkers, uh, post uh, uh, tech bubble, and it just kind of went on and on with TARP and all the different quantitative easing. David kind of finished with when you asked him about what to do in the market. You know, t tell us about your outlook on market risk. David thinks that we are in a super bubble. David thinks that we uh, are likely to to have very large corrections, even though he said it's hard to predict and he doesn't want to predict. I believe I heard him say that he wouldn't be surprised to see us lose more than 50%. I wouldn't be surprised to see the market lose two thirds. And that would even would not even get us back to undervalued. He says that it feels a little bit like we're in the March 2000 timeframe, March, April 2000, and markets are in a, in a blow off. It's absolutely true. It feels like March of 2000. It's a little bit too cute, I think, to say it's exactly the same because here we are in March of 2024. We are in a blow off and it's impossible to tell when this thing will end. My best guess is it goes higher for a couple months and then rolls over. He said, avoid things that are that are that are wrapped up in this bubble. The Mag Seven, of which thirty three percent of the S and P five hundred is comprised of, avoid that. Avoid cryptos, which he sees as a bubble, and buy Treasury bills. Well, we agree. We're over forty percent Treasury bills. They're still yielding over five percent. Essentially, he's saying the Fed's crazy. The market's going to crash. You're finally getting five percent in Treasury bills. Why not sit there and wait? And and we agree. Yeah. So, um, you know, David, uh, what I really pay attention to with him is, you know, he has sat in the center of the machine of power, both in D.C. and in Wall Street. So he really knows how all the mechanics work. He knows the institutions and he actually knows personally the people running them. So uh, you, you can't discount his perspective because he's got such an insider view. Um you know, I heard him talk about sort of two things. One, you know, some imminent risks uh, just from market valuations alone um, and from uh, the lag effects of, you know, relatively recent policies, the, you know, six trillion that was, you know, issued during the, the pandemic in terms of stimulus that deformed everything then. But he's also talking about the end of some very big secular trends, right? His great deformation um, you know, really started decades ago. And he, he said that, you know, we've been in this, um, this constant, the economy has been in a constant refi mode for decades, right? As, you know, basically post Volcker era, as debt got cheaper and cheaper and cheaper over the next 40 years, you know, we were able to, to continue to refinance at lower rates, you know, free up uh, capital to reinvest or, or put into assets to push them higher. Um, and he's basically saying that that's long term secular trend, which pretty much is what every sort of, you know, living active investor right now has been their career, right, is now switching. And he's, he calls it the great refi reversal. Um, so, you know, debt's going to be re-rating for years. He thinks at higher interest rates, even than, than we have right now. Um, and he just thinks that's going to be a total game changer. And if, if that does happen, I, I, I think he's right. Um so it's kind of this confluence of like, hey, there's some real short term worries uh, to have, but but they, they they're overlapping on longer term worries that he has, too. So, of course, the, the gazillion dollar question is like, when does all this matter? Right. Because right now the animal spirits are driving the markets. It's all about euphoria. Right. And uh, as you said earlier, Mike, you know, this can go on a lot longer than we think. You know, you said, wow, geez, you know, some of these things Stockman's saying he's been saying for the past decade or more. Right. So when's it all going to matter? Because if it's 10 years down the road, well, then it doesn't really matter that much right now. We can just sort of keep playing, you know, the long game, the buy the dip game and whatnot. Now, now Stockman, you know, seems to think that the wheels are going to come off either soon after the election, if not sooner, right? Um, uh, you, Mike, uh, you know, the, Stockman at, at this point in his career, you know, he writes a newsletter. So if it takes another year or two, or if it happens next month, yeah, I mean, he's going to write about it, but he's beyond his own personal portfolio. He doesn't, you know, have too much at risk. You guys at New Harbor, you're managing hundreds of millions of dollars in client capital. 
So how are you handling this right now, Mike? Yeah, it's a, it's a hard job, Adam. I'm not going to lie. Uh, we were early, and I'll be very open about that. David Stockman was early. Nobody knew just how long this thing was going to go on. Nobody could have guessed how long markets could stay ridiculously overvalued. You can measure overvaluation in the markets. The Schiller price earnings ratio is still in the mid 30s, high 30s, depending upon when you look at it and how you measure it. And if you adjust for uh, for profit margins, where probably touching 50 if you normalize profit margins because profit margins are are at least short term stretched to the upside because of deficit spending by the government which is not sustainable so nobody would have guessed it would have gone on that long not not me not david stockman nobody um not one of our heroes john husband all of us were fooled by just how far this thing could go and right. so hey, everyone so, sorry to interrupt but i i just got to repeat the, the great husman quote where he said mm -hmm. bubble markets force you to make a choice right look like an idiot now or look like an idiot later and That's uh right. and, and i think they do you either have to say look i'm gonna i'm gonna sit out the party because i know it's not going to end well and everybody while the party continues raging points at you and makes fun of you Sometimes that can be really hard to endure if the party keeps raging a lot longer than you thought, right? That's what pulled, you know, Newton famously back into the South Sea bubble, right? So, anyways, it's really it's very hard, and um, you know, we've got we've got strategies and rules in place. A big part of what we offer as value is to be able to to absorb emotion and and, and to apply a rules based system to our methodology. But still, we're only about forty percent invested in the market here, forty percent long with hedges. And so if we got a further melt up, we're going to underperform. However, we're still going to make money. And what we're trying to do is participate and still not have too much downside exposure. And the way we do that is A, by having an allocation of only 40% here. And we might even trim that if, if we go more vertical in the market. And B, taking income in with covered call sales and having, having hedges that will kick in at lower levels, say 10% below here. I'll show a chart maybe a little bit later that'll show our hedge on the S&P. But those hedges have some kind of deductible. So we might lose 2% if we have a 10% crash in one day, that type of thing. But we're trying to balance that out the best we can because our best guess is this market goes a little higher. So to answer your question, we try to play the game as best we can and give back as little as we can. And nobody knows when this thing's going to turn. Everything we're looking at right now continues to say that the offensive team is on the field. All of our short-term indicators just reversed up again, albeit at extremely high nosebleed levels. This market has been amazing. It just won't give up much. We hit an all-time high last Friday, and um, here we are today on recording on Wednesday the 13th. Just a few days ago, we hit a high on Friday, immediately reversed, and now we're trading maybe a half a percent below the high. I believe that this market will frustratingly continue to put in new highs, maybe even go vertical for a short period of time. I almost hope for that to happen at this point because that'll be a very clear signal that the end is near. So that could happen, or maybe we just peter out and roll over at some point in, in a random time frame. We just don't know. For now, we're picking the strongest sectors. We're hedging the best we can. And we're seeing some things that we really like, like a breakout in gold and um, and gold miners starting to act better, which we can talk about too. But uh, you know, that's my best guess, Adam, as we go a couple more months here and we're trying to squeeze a little bit more juice out of the lemon if we can without without getting stung. Okay, but um, and this sort of echoes what Lance Roberts said on the program this weekend, which is um, he, he said it, it's, it's really time to start hedging your positions. Um, I know you guys use hedges kind of as a, as a, you know, general policy, but it sounds like, you know, you're, you're having even more risk management in the portfolio than normal, given these conditions, you've got less market exposure, you've got more, uh, more hedges on the positions that you do have a greater degree of hedges. You're nodding as I'm saying all this. Correct. Um, I also just want to note too. You know, what we're seeing is eerily what several people on this channel predicted at the end of last year, um, Felix Zuloff uh, being one that sticks out in my mind, where you know he basically said Q1, he thought was going to surprise to the upside in terms of uh, both the economy and uh, in the markets. And so far, he's been right. Um, now, 
just to finish his prediction, he he thought sort of, you know, end of Q1 was going to be the high water mark. And then the markets were going to uh, have a much rougher uh, you know, rest of the year uh, declining by as much as 30% or more. Um, TBD, if that's going to happen, um, we'll, we'll keep watch. But it, it is interesting just to note that that so far the Q1 script has been playing out pretty much exactly as he predicted here. Um, so why don't you bring up your chart of the S&P there, Mike, to, to show us how you're hedging it? Because um, I, I want to give you a chance to talk about that if you wanted to give an update on gold, like you said. Um, but then I want to I want to close with a conversation about um, Stockman's comment there that that you know sort of one of the next stages he sees here is uh, the Main Street economy running out of gas, in his words. Um, because end of the day, the people that are watching this video are regular people, right? And um, uh, I, I want to kind of dive into what a what running out of gas really means for for the main street populace. What folks should be planning for? Yes, there will probably be portfolio uh, downside in that environment, but there's going to be other elements of their life like job loss and whatever. So I want to want to reserve a little bit of time to talk to you about that. So okay, we got the S and P up here. Okay, great. So here's the S and P 500 on a daily chart. You mentioned Felix Zuloff. I remember that interview. It was it was great. If I remember correctly, I think that Felix said that we would go up to maybe five thousand plus or minus. I believe he said approximately five thousand, and then a drop down into the three thousands. I think that's that's very likely. I also think it's likely that we might go a little more vertical here before this is over. This has been a relentless uptrend since last October. Here's the bottom in October. If I switch this to the weekly chart for a minute, you can see that almost every single week since October has been up, 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 up. And even these red candles are hardly even down. Maybe one here, the first week of January. And so this is very, very bullish. If I go to the monthly, you can see what we've all been living through here is... 15 years of a market that's tried to correct, but just hasn't been allowed to. And so we're going on the fifth straight up month here. There's no saying when this will end. You know, again, I wouldn't be surprised to see 5,500 even. If we just see a big kind of moonshot spike up here, that would be the kind of parabolic blow off top that would send an all clear signal in terms of taking chips off the table. But even then it can go further than you think. Right now, going back to the daily chart, we hit an all-time high last Friday. It immediately reversed late in the morning, and we came down on Monday, opened down on Monday, but we immediately bounced back yesterday on Tuesday, and today on Wednesday, we're trading pretty flat. Presently, the all-time high is 5189. We're trading at 5169, so we're about 20 points off the all-time high. I very much think that we're likely to make a new high. And, and, and technically... Um, that type of red candle that we saw there on Friday that has sort of, you know, I don't know what you call it. Um, uh, I don't, an inverted hammer. I don't know what name it is, right? But it's, it's either got, a shooting star or an inverted hammer. Yeah. Okay. Um, but but isn't isn't that a, a can be the sign of like a, a top, right? Where the, the, the market runs up, but then it can't hold those prices and then it ends up closing down. Um uh yeah i don't know why i'm remembering that there's there's some it's a it's a bearish engulfing day as well bearish engulfing that's what i was looking for mm -hmm. yeah uh, let me put it this way if, if if we don't hit a new high <laughs> would would that be looked at as the bearish engulfing that marked the the reversal yeah i mean but yes but i but i've also found that particularly on daily charts these types of signals aren't that reliable bearish engulfing would be a little more re reliable on a weekly Okay. or a monthly chart but this is indeed a bearish engulfing day uh, and a shooting star you know we made a new high and we ended near the low of the day and engulfed the previous day however this market's been so strong you know look at every single time we've had a pullback it's been two days to a new high two days to a new high over and over and over again and it's happening again now i wouldn't be surprised to see thursday or friday make a new high thereby negating that now, yeah. I should and point you out your short, your short term indicators have all turned back positive, right? They have a number of yeah. different things, momentum indicators, breath indicators, um, bullish percents that we look at across the major major index indices have all reversed up. And I should say at very high levels, they hardly even 
took a breath before immediately going back to bullish. You know, that's the kind of market that we've been in. And look at the distance to the 50-day moving average. It's it's quite a big difference here. You know, almost 200 S&P points, and then even further down to the 200-day moving average. So at some point, there's going to be a correction, and we're going to come back at least to the 50-day moving average. The question is when? And might we go higher first? I think that, yeah, we're going to go higher first, very likely. We have a, a hedge here. That's what this purple line is on 15% notional of the portfolio. We keep moving it up. It was at 4,100 a few months ago. Then at 4,500, we just moved it up to 4,700. If we get a pop up here to 5,250 or 5,300, we'll probably move that hedge up to 4,900. And we keep putting a little bit more money into the hedge every time we do that. But the higher the market moves up, the less money we have to put in. At some point, if we go vertical here, you know, we can move this up even further and it's not going to cost us much. And invariably, inevitably, when we get the rollover, we won't give up much. We'll always give up something because the distance between here and that line is equivalent to, to a deductible, like an auto insurance deductible. But we can keep moving it up because we don't know when this is going to end. And so that's what we're doing right now. All right. Um, well, I, I always appreciate it when you visually walk folks through kind of your hedging strategies there and show them, you know, really folks, this is the, this is a, a material part of the value that a good financial advisor can bring to your portfolio management, right? Where it's, it's, you know, putting that insurance uh, into the pro, pro into the portfolio um, trying to do it at, at, on as cost effective a basis as possible. But basically what this is, is providing, you know, some degree of safety net um, to, to your portfolio so that if indeed there is a correction, which of course, many of the recent uh, experts on this program are concerned about because of how stretch valuations are, you know, if you're still participating in the market on the long side, you can you can re reduce and sometimes really material materially reduce materially reduced your downside risk, which is something that most regular investors just don't do, right? They 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 basically just have one of two options: I'm either long, or I'm out, or I'm short. Um, and shorting, look, if you time it perfectly, you can make a lot of money in shorting, but but shorting is really tough, uh, and and honestly, most regular retail investors don't have much experience with it, and those who do, most of them don't have a lot of don't have a very successful track record. So again, doing things like these prudent hedges. Um, very, very wise for uh, uh, retail investors to consider deploying. And if you don't have much experience doing it yourself, again, that's that's a real part of the value add that a, a good financial advisor can can bring. Um, all right, Mike. Well, let's let's trundle under to gold real quick before we start wrapping it up. Yeah, and I'll just point out right before I pull up this chart of gold that we're taking profits in some positions as well. We we have been buying the strongest sectors in this run up over the last bunch of months since October. We're taking profits on insurance. That's been, it was a nice gain. We already took profits in the industrial sector. So, um, you know, one thing we are doing is we're starting to actually reduce our exposure a little bit at a time, sector by sector. So, and, and, and sorry, Mike, when you say you're reducing your exposure, are, are you just position resizing? Like, hey, it was 5% of the portfolio. It got to seven. We're bringing it back down to five. Or are you actually reducing the original exposure, like we're, we're bringing it down to 4% or 3%. And we're actually selling it. XLI was what we were in for industrials and we sold a covered call on it as it got extended. That could, could completely capped out. So we closed the position. We sold a call on the insurance sector. That was uh, ticker symbol KIE. Um, that is maturing later this week. We're going to let that get called away, barring any you know, major, major crash in the market between now and Friday. So what we'll often do is as a market gets stretched, we'll sell call options, which gives us a way to put a target on that stock saying, we will be glad to sell it if it gets up there. And in exchange for selling that call, we're gonna, we take premium in. So it brings income into the account. So both industrials and insurance are going out that way. And that's a total of about seven and a half percent of our portfolio. We are putting in other pieces. We just added software last week, for instance, and we're also looking at things like materials, uh, both industrial materials, basic materials, and even energy slash oil is starting to look better. So uh, I won't promise or say exactly what we're going to do there, but we've took off 7.5%. We put back 2.5% pretty quickly. 
And we'll probably put back that other 5% fairly quickly too, keeping us right around 40%. That is the 40% that I mentioned earlier. But that 40% is 15% hedged with the S&P puts I just told you about, plus many of those individual positions have their own call options sold against them. So our net exposure mathematically is not 40%. It's something under 30%, and it quickly goes to zero on a deeper drop because of the, the hedges that we have in place. So lastly, I'll bring up the chart of gold. We've been saying this for a long time. The gold chart looks fantastic, and it's been doing very well even without the help of the dollar. The dollar hasn't been falling. The dollar's been relatively strong. Here is a daily chart of GLD, an ETF that tracks gold. You might want to start the monthly chart. 15 years consolidation here. The last four years have been really hard for gold bulls because they sat through a 40% bear market after the 2011 high. And then when it looked like all was clear, we were breaking out of this nice cup formation, gold bulls got really frustrated because now they had to deal with four tough, long years of sideways consolidation. And how long have we all been saying, the people that in the gold community anyway, been saying, when the heck is gold going to break out? What's wrong with gold? Is it being suppressed? Why is Bitcoin at new all-time highs and gold isn't participating? Well, gold kind of trudged along on its own over the last four years and created a triple top. Most triple tops don't hold. This one didn't either. Actually created an inverse head and shoulders formation. And then boom, it just broke out. We're well over $2,100 an ounce, closing in on $2,200 an ounce. And so gold right now looks fantastic from a chart perspective. And I can tell you, I've read articles lately that talk about um, commodities trading advisors being long gold, momentum traders are long gold, trend followers are long gold. Because anytime you have a commodity at an, a new all-time high with no upside, uh, no resistance overhead, a lot of people will jump in and try to ride that. Now, that's no guarantee that it's going higher, but it doesn't have any overhead resistance anymore. And nobody knows how far it can go. And this is all happening after the Fed funds tar target rate is up to 5.5%. At some point, Powell will pivot probably after a stock market crash. As rates come back down, that'll be a tailwind for gold. And I personally think we're entering an era here where confidence is going to be lost in the central bank's ability to print money forever. And it's almost like gold is sniffing that out. So gold here at this breakout offers quite a good opportunity. I don't know how far it can go. We've been saying for a long time, though, that a quick measured move would be up to around 2,500 in gold. And it's presently 21 and change. So there's still some good opportunity here. All right. And Mike, I, I want to give you your, your due. You've been pulling this chart up for a good while now, you know, basically telling folks you think this breakout was likely to occur. And it finally has after, you know, what is that? That's, you know, 13 years or something like that. Um, 13 so, years. So kudos to you for, you know, over the past quarter or two, bringing up this chart and saying, hey, folks, it looks like a big move is about to happen. Um, we'll see if it ends up riding up to 2,500. We'll, we'll keep letting you update us uh, on a weekly basis on this. Um, but it is um, it is interesting to see. And for those that own gold, myself included, it's very nice to see. So tell us a bit about the miners, which have have uh, so far really, really underperformed gold, which is a big head scratcher because they're, you know, they're presumed to be the leveraged play on the price of gold. Right. Price of gold goes up. The mining stock should go up some multiple of that, given their leverage to, to gold. Um, they haven't. Um, are you seeing any signs of life there? We are. Here's here's the miners. This is GDX, the, the 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 majors, the large gold mining companies. How frustrating has this been? You know, the same four or five years that gold's been going sideways, gold mining stocks have been going sideways to down, right? So gold is back at a at a at a new high. Let's kind of throw away these old highs because that's a long time ago. But why isn't gold, why isn't GDX at least at these old highs just a few years ago? So this is what's been frustrating. And it's almost like the gold miners are trading at a discount relative to gold. I personally think the market is going to catch up and, and change its mind on on miners. It's always a it's a, always a dangerous thing to say the market's wrong, but frankly, I think the market is is wrong on this, and that they're punishing miners too much for what can be perceived as bad management decisions by executives, bad 
acquisitions, bad use of capital, bad use of the balance sheet, that kind of thing. And this certainly concerns about political intervention and environmental concerns. But the truth is, in my opinion, overall, this sector is small and underfollowed. And I think it can move very quickly. Let's take a look at a, at a, look at a daily chart. Just two weeks ago, gold miners were at a new relative low and the, the negativity was palpable. Even longtime gold managers that we know, um, you know, put out comments that were almost capitulatory, almost like throwing in the towel. And then right after that, we went up very, very quickly here. And gold miners retook their 50 and 200 day moving average. They're now approaching uh, last fall's highs. If we consolidate here and break out, then we can start to see short covering and the miners could really start to play catch up. And we have charts, relative strength charts of gold versus miners, miners versus gold. And over the last week or so, gold miners relative strength has hooked up or uh, you know, moved up relative to gold, which means for on a percentage basis, miners are now moving up faster than gold is over the last few weeks. We'll see what happens on a longer term. Uh, if I, maybe a weekly chart could be helpful here. Oh, you know, a weekly chart just shows this consolidation over the last couple of weeks. Okay, look, the last couple of uh, years, I mean. I wouldn't be surprised to see GDX move up very quickly to 34, let's say, over the next couple of weeks, as long as gold prices stay where they are. The bottom line, though, is it's somewhat of a spring and a drastic underperformance relative to gold. And I hope that it resolves to the upside. Time will tell. Yeah, what's so interesting to me there is, um, again, um, these companies are are supposed to, by their nature, you know, like I said, be leveraged plays on the price of gold. Um, but as you said, you know, Wall Street loves momentum, right? So anything that begins to to start breaking out, that's capital tends to move into that space, and the mining space is tiny. <laughs> and so the thesis has always been, well, once it starts moving, and Wall Street wakes up to that and starts directing capital that way that these things could positively explode because you've got, it wouldn't take a lot of capital to basically, you know, double the market cap of the entire sector, right? So do you think that type of moment may lie ahead for this space if gold keeps rising? Absolutely. The market cap could easily double. Um, GDX is trading right around 30 here. That would mean GDX around 60. Yeah, I think that maybe that's a little bit of a stretch to get there on a $2,500 gold. But if gold overshoots to the upside a little bit, goes to 26, 2800, and we start to see a repricing of some of these things because the price earnings ratio in the sector is very low, mid to high single digits in, in, in a lot of cases. So if we start to see multiple expansion and the market starts to value them at, let's say, 15x instead of something in the high single digits, and at the same time, gold moves higher and money starts to pour in, absolutely, we might see close to a double in GDX um, and and much more in some of the individual names. Obviously okay. not a promise and not advice to any particular person, but this is this is my opinion on what's likely to happen in the sector. Okay, all right. Well, I gotta wrap it up here for time-wise. Um, I gotta remind folks about the conference, um, which is coming up now, folks, in just a couple of days, the day this video is launching, is uh, Thursday. The conference is on Saturday. You only have a couple of days left to register for it, folks. Um, I'll give more detail on that in just a second. But last question for you, Mike, which is, um, <clears throat> you know, as I said, Stockman talked about kind of mainstream Main Street taking it on the chin as uh, what he expects to happen starts to unfold. Um, so we've got folks watching. Um, obviously, those who have uh, sizable financial asset portfolios have got to be worried about the type of market correction that David thinks is lurking out there. And, you know, he said, look, wouldn't surprise them to see it be 50%, maybe even more when all was said and done. Um, so you got to watch out for that. But, you know, if, if the mainstream economy really starts going hard into recession, you know, then you have to start worrying about other things, right, that, that are that are more, um, that are even lower on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, like losing your income, right, which then, you know, bleeds into like, being able to keep your house and being able to put food on the table and stuff like that. So um, you talk to real people, you know, all the time, uh, lots of clients, lots of potential clients who are, are calling you about their wealth and whatnot. Um, you know, is it time for those people to start maybe doing some, some war gaming about what might happen if, if Stockman's right and we do begin to, you know, 
a hard landing starts to manifest where it, it might not just be about like, you know, what hedges do I need in my portfolio and what percent should I be in safe assets like T-bills versus like, what are some other things I should be doing with my life to reduce my cost footprint, build up a savings fund, and maybe think about other ways to generate streams of income. Yeah, this is where it could get really dark as you start to speculate about some things in the future. If you if you accept what I think and what I, and what David Stockman thinks, and that the Federal Reserve, along with other central banks, have completely lost their minds over the last 15 years. If you really think that through and ask yourself, why have they done that? Well, they've done that because the stakes are that high. And it's like, um, well, it's like a Ponzi scheme, frankly, and that you have to keep getting larger and larger and larger, else the truth gets known. And what does that truth mean? What are the ramifications of that truth being found out? Well, you think about the fact that we're in what's likely the final five years or so of a fourth turning. That gets even scarier. What does that mean? When you couple the climax of a fourth turning with a no-holds-barred central bank that has no plan B, what does that look like? You know, we, we talked about austerity and a 30 to 50% reduction in standard of living. Well, are financial markets even going to continue to exist? I think so. You have to make a call on that, though, right? And you have to think about what all of this means to your life. The problem is it's impossible to tell what the climax of a fourth turning will look like under this scenario. Will we go to war? It's likely. Will we have you know, internal strife and social unrest? Absolutely. David Stockman talked about that. I thought a lot of this was going to come to a head back in 2016 when Donald Trump was elected. And I know that Stockman at that time had a book out and he, I think he called Donald Trump the, you know, something about, I forget what he exactly said, but he said the the orange the orange hope or something like that. And I thought all of this was going to come to a head then, and and it didn't. And so here we are, eight years later, and we could have, um, you know, we we could have a a a good time. The first time we could have a two term president, you know. So Trump was president between 2016 and 2020, and he could come back in 2022. Sorry, 2024. In fact, that's what the futures in the betting markets say. There's going to be a lot of people unhappy about that. And David talked about a scenario in which um, you know Congress can't confirm and vote, and we could have a deadlock. So all of these things line up with the with the culmination, the climax of this fourth turning. What to do about it? Simplify. Simplify, simplify, simplify. Pay off debt. Have some gold and silver. It's it's great to have some other sources of income if you can. A lot of people don't. A lot of our clients, though, are retirees who thankfully have Social Security and or pensions. So as long as those things keep paying, they've got to worry less about income. I do feel bad for the 40-something, the 50-something that's in a corporate job that is afraid of losing that job if we have this kind of situation. All I can say is to the extent that you can pay down debt and simplify, that's going to help you. It's going to help right. you out. And just to be clear, Mike, these are conversations that, that your clients can have with you, right? They can come to you and say, look, this is my situation. Help me sort of, you know, battle strategy all of this and, and help me come up with a plan for all this, correct? That's exactly right. These are the conversations we have all the time. A lot of it's psychological, and I think we're good at it. I think we're good at helping people feel safer, even though we don't know the future either, 100%. But uh, we can help simplify, um, focus in on some kind of plan, which takes away a lot of the anxiety and fear. And um, yeah, absolutely. That's what we do. We're, and we're happy to do it. All right, great. Well, folks, look, if you, um, if you feel you would benefit from a conversation like that, reach out to your financial advisor and schedule that conversation today. If you don't have one, I'll tell you in a second about how you can perhaps talk with the guys at New Harbor, or at least one of the advisors that, that um, Thoughtful Money endorses. Um, all right, just to wrap things up here, um, first, if you enjoyed having uh, David Stockman on the program, would like to see him come back in the future, uh, please let him know by hitting the like button, then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. And again, yes, my reminder, run, don't walk. If you haven't yet registered for this weekend's conference uh, and you want to you, you want to attend it, or if you can't attend it, but you, you want to get the replays from the entire event, um, which everybody who registers will get, then go to thoughtfulmoney.com slash conference and sign up now. And remember, if you are a premium subscriber to our Substack, you get $50 off the ticket price. Uh, go look in your email and, and find the code that we emailed to you if you're a premium subscriber. 
Um, all right. And, uh, and then to Mike's point there, um, you know, uh, best time to, uh, uh, repair your roof is when the sun is shining, right? Not when it's raining. So with all these storm clouds that, that David, uh, painted for us that, that he sees on the horizon, uh, you want to you want to plan for that now. So like I said, if you've got a good financial advisor who is helping you strategize, putting together a personalized portfolio strategy for you and then executing it for you, great, stick with them. But give them a call, make sure that you're as prepared as you can be. If you don't have one or you'd like a second opinion from an experienced one, maybe even Mike and uh, John and their team there at New Harbor Financial, then consider scheduling a free consultation with one of the financial advisors that Thoughtful Money endorses. To do that, just go to thoughtfulmoney.com, fill out the short form there. Only takes you a couple seconds to fill out. Uh, you get a personalized uh, consultation that is bespoke to your individual situation. Uh, these consultations don't cost anything. There's no commitment to work with these guys. It's just a free public service they offer to help as many people as possible, position as prudently as possible, for what may lie ahead. Mike, thanks so much for hanging with me for yet another week. Look forward to seeing you next week. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching. Good to be here, Adam, and we'll see you next week.